Good evening. This is Charles X. White. Yes, we made it to the new year, 2021. And we want to invite all of you that are listening or passing by your computer, or if you have your computer on and looking and listening, call somebody. We have some good subjects and good presenters uh, that we'll have conversation with tonight. Uh, before we get started into this journey for tonight, uh, we have a pretty interesting lineup. Our lineup uh, includes uh, nurse practitioners, and they're going to explain some things to us about COVID. Mark, do you have that COVID slide? As well, okay. Um, so she's gonna. We're gonna have a conversation about COVID. Uh, we also have Cedric uh, uh, Cedric Keeler calling in or joining us. He has a radio talk show, and he's gonna introduce some subjects from his show. And we have Dr. Michael Michael Adams from Texas Southern, and. Uh, He's gonna to try to join us to talk about some of the political and historical uh, goings on current events and profiles of what has happened with this election with the new president, uh, Joe Biden and the outgoing president, crazy Donald, I mean, Donald Trump, uh, who everybody's looking for, but nobody can find him at this time. So we don't know where old Donald is, well, wherever Don lives, Don, you need to stay there. All right. Tonight, January 21st, we have an interesting lineup for the year. And that lineup includes, and some of you have already seen, we've had Mayor Sylvester Turner, uh, Special uh, Assistant, uh, to the district attorney, C.O. Bradford, uh, Dr. Renita Latham, uh, representatives from the Urban League. And that's one thing I wanna make sure I talk about a little bit. For all of the veterans in the audience, for all of the veterans in the audience, if you need any assistance for housing repair, we would like for you to call the Houston Area Urban League at this number, 281-220-6012, 281-220-6012. And ask for Ms. Uh, Glenda Kizzy. Uh, if you are a widow of a veteran and you have experienced uh, some problems getting your house repaired after Harvard, give her a call. We will be giving this, uh, this number and name and announcement out as we go through to the, sh the show tonight. Now, just be prepared that if the show, if all our guests don't show up, then we may finish a little early. Uh, and if we do, we'll let you know. Also, in the studio with us right now is a lady that I'm just meeting. We've been communicating by email. And uh, we're not gonna, the one thing I know about her that's good, that she's from the North side. <laughs> so I want her to, if this is Miss Latricia Harrison, She's a registered nurse practitioner and she's representing, now if I mess this up, you have to correct me, Ms. Harrison, uh, Nurse Harrison. Uh, she's representing the Black Professional Nurses, Registered Nurses, I better stop. Just yeah, introduce yeah. everything. <laughs> 
Thank you, Mr. White. I am Dr. Latricia Harrison. I'm a nurse practitioner, so I'm a doctor nurse, and I'm representing the National Black Nurse Practitioner Association. And we're an association of nurse practitioners who've come together since 2011 to bring information to the nurse practitioner community, and specifically African-American nurse practitioners on um, scholarship, education, and mentorship, and precepting other nurse practitioners who are coming behind us. So as nurse practitioners, what we basically do is we are able to diagnose and treat and take care of patients just as if a general practitioner would a physician, but we're nurses who've gone and gotten additional training. Okay. Now, Mark, we, we want to see that uh, COVID uh, slide uh, while we're having this discussion. And, uh, and if you can, interchange it with the one from the city of Houston. Um, now, one of the reasons in our series that we're uh, presenting, the name of this new series for 2021 is called Community Science, Community Science. And we're interviewing professionals. We're gonna have some uh, pharmacists, chemists. We've already had Dr. Sylvia, uh, Dr. Sylvia Gates from uh, Northern California, who is with the Black Professional Female Physicians. Um, so we're gonna have a series with Dr. Harrison and her group, and then we're gonna have a panel discussion with a representative from the nurse practitioners, the doctors association, the pharmacists, the chemists. So we're gonna have a, a end of the series, a panel discussion. I'm a firm believer that black people need to hear black people talking about COVID or whatever other malady that we suffer from. I was involved with a study in 2012 uh, with Texas A&M and FEMA, and uh, it was, we did the, in Port Arthur. And the study had to do with emergency messaging and how people from different backgrounds, languages, how they receive certain messages, whether they uh, speak Spanish. One of the central uh, common factors that came out in the survey is that it was the word trust. If they didn't trust you, well, the message wouldn't get through. So right now we have a lot of people telling us a lot of things. And uh, Dr. Gates uh, really put the metal to the pedal and she defined some things. And uh, she's been on CNN as well. So, so we wanna try to bring that type of message to the community. Uh, so that we can feel good about whether they're talking about a vaccine, whether they're talking about testing. We have subject matter experts. And you can get this video from YouTube. You can get it on our website. Uh, just type in Charity Productions and it'll come up and go to our media suite and you can see all of the, the uh, videos and the uh, interviews that we have done as well as the uh, phone conversations or tele-town hall meetings that we've held. You can uh, listen at them and play them uh, as a rebroadcast from our website. Just go to Charity Productions. If you have a uh, question, you can email me at cpxw at hotmail.com. Now, testing. So Dr. Harrison, give us your, your take on how the testing is going for Black people. Well, to be quite honest, I, I work in a predominantly um, indigent population. Mm -hmm. So I'm located, my office is located in Greens Point. And most of the patients that I see they're still very hesitant about receiving testing. 
is after they talk with me and I go ahead and reassure them that the tests are safe, they'll go ahead and come in and get tested. But then you still have that small population of patients who are very hesitant and feel like, oh, well, I don't have shortness of breath. I don't have a fever, so I'm okay. But the way COVID is presenting, if you present with a sneeze, you should be tested. And our community, we're still very hesitant on wanting to go in and receive the test because we don't necessarily believe that the tests are accurate. And there's been so much mistrust with the government until that's just really pushed us further behind in testing. What, what about this thing uh, uh, when, when it says, I know recently I heard, matter of fact, one of my tests came back re recently and said inconclusive data. And, you know, uh, which, which testing is the most accurate? Is it the uh, saliva test or is it the swab test or is it the in the nose uh, swab test? Is, is one of them better than the other? Yes. So it's called a PCR, which is the one in the nose, the swab test. That's going to be your most accurate test. The saliva test and even some of your rapid uh, tests, we do know that those tests have a high probability of a false negative when the patient very well may be positive in their results. So the PCR is going to be the most accurate. Now, when you get an inconclusive test, that means that the test may not have been performed adequately or accurately. So if I tell my patients, if your eyes don't water, the test wasn't done correctly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. So how many times, uh, what is uh, between tests? Should you take it every 10 days, every seven, every 14, what? The CDC has three different guidelines on when you should retest. Now, wait a minute, Mostly who's the CDC? the Center for Disease Control, the okay. government agency that is really the regulatory agency that most providers are looking to. So with the CDC, they're recommending that you can retest now in seven days. You don't necessarily have to retest. You can be cleared based upon symptoms. So if the patient no longer has symptoms, then they're saying, well, after they've quarantined their seven to 14 days or seven to 10 days now, then they don't have to retest. I personally recommend retesting simply because what I have seen is that a patient may not serial convert to negative. It can take up to four months before that patient tests negative again after that initial positive test. Now, um, have you been keeping up? Uh, with the whole conversation on supply chain as far as having enough PPEs, enough testing material? Have you been keeping up with that? Absolutely. And that's a very big issue. Um, unfortunately, the providers in the community, we are, I feel like, overlooked when it comes down to receiving the supplies, receiving the testing supplies, the PPE. Initially, when COVID first happened, all of the supplies were going to the hospitals and to your federally funded clinics. Your primary care offices in the community, we were not getting those things. So even today, we're still not on priority, even we're receiving the vaccine. Um, we are the bottom of the totem pole. So most of those things are going to your bigger hospitals, to your federally funded agencies. So the people in the community where the patients are actually going to go, where we as African-Americans are going to go, we don't necessarily have the supplies. So we've resorted to buying the supplies ourselves because we can't get them in our usual manner when we were getting them before. Well, let me ask you this. So you need an advocate. So you need me to raise some hell over there with the government <laughs> so you can get some supplies over there. That's what we, we need to talk about that off, off the air. Please but now, and, will you, and thank will you. you. Get, huh? I said, please and thank you. We need you to raise hell. <laughs> okay. So so let me ask you, will you will the government reimburse you for the money that you spend for the uh, material? 
No, not on the money that we're uh, spending on supplies. Absolutely not. They do reimburse for uh, those patients who are uninsured and need to be tested. They are reimbursing that way. Typically for me in my practice, what I do is I send it to the lab and the lab is able to submit that claim in through the CARES Act, which is set up because of the funding that they're giving to providers. They can bill through the CARES Act and be reimbursed. Oh, okay. So you do have some some relief. Yes. I don't so, get paid for my time, per se, but the, the, at least the patient will be able to get the test done if they need it. Right. So, so now President Biden, um, and this is where I'm going to segue over to Dr. Adams. Dr. Adams, meet Dr. Harrison, and she's a... Uh, uh, Tell them what you are again, because uh, I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> Please. I'm a family nurse <laughs> practitioner. <laughs> okay. Nice Dr. to meet Harris, you. And, and nice to meet you. And hello, Charles. Always good to meet you. <laughs> yes, sir. So so now in in these uh these executive orders, we're gonna segue over to the to the political side for a minute, Doc. Okay, we're gonna come back to you on the on the medical side, on the public health side. Um, in those executive orders that uh, President Biden was signing, I thought I heard him say something about he's reauthorizing some money for testing. So, uh, were yeah. you are you up on those, uh, Dr. Adam? Yeah, I've been. Uh, first of all, I've been really busy. This is our uh, busy season at the university in terms of registering students. So uh, I was, I, I think I caught some of that, but I think it's all a part of number one, uh, in the first hundred days, of course, we have to address some challenges facing, uh, you know, the country in terms of the pandemic. And so uh, I'm not surprised that that was there. And we know that we're expecting, uh, there was a promise of uh, doing another stimulus in terms of uh, a $1,600 check. Uh, but of course, uh, it's very important because the supply chain, and, and I missed the earlier part of the conversation, but uh, certainly there's, there's going to be a mass mandate, I think, on federal property, federal buildings. Uh, and also, uh, we have to probably, and Charles, as, as an expert in terms of emergency management, uh, I, I would assume and hope that FEMA and also the military can become a part of the supply chain and the distribution so that we can move fast forward because we have more people dying uh, daily than they died in the 9-11 um, uh, bombing. So we, we're getting on average 3,000 people are dying and we are now over 400,000. And I think there's a prediction within the next month that number could actually uh, bump up to 500,000. So Certainly, that's that's the urgency. That's the number one thing in terms of the uh, the executive order. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you this, uh, Dr. Harrison. I think the number has gotten to be four thousand. Was the number that hit today? Four thousand deaths today in one day. Now, are you getting any political support to as a as from from that standpoint? Uh, 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 is the city council member, uh, have you reached out anywhere like that and we need to try to get some support around you? Um, that would be great. No, I haven't been able to get in contact. I have reached out to the representative in my area. Um, and unfortunately, I've met with his staff member, but I haven't been able to get in contact with him. I've invited him to come to my clinic um, so that the people in the area in, in the indigent area, North Houston, Greenspoint area, um, there, there, that's a ton of patients there and we're being overlooked, I feel like. Mm -hmm. And those, we don't have the resources, we don't have vaccines, we don't have, you know, testing. I may get 50 tests, you know, to try and test in the area. So you have to have, as you stated earlier, the trust in the provider. And they're not just going to randomly go over to the camp, the, the testing site off of, in Northeast Houston at uh, off of Homestead in Little York. They're not right. going to go there because they don't trust the people. They don't trust the results. 
You know, so we have to have those providers who the patients trust out there campaigning and telling them it's safe to come in and be tested to get the vaccine. But I don't have the support from the political side of it to try and get the information out there to the patients. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Do, do, what's your zip code? My clinic is in 677060. Okay. Um, have, have you seen any of the uh, press conference recently that Dr. Fauci has done? Uh, is he approaching this thing uh, as it should be from what you've seen and heard? Yes, I, I believe he is. I believe that his information is very accurate. I feel like he has been very open and honest as far as the treatment of COVID since the very beginning. Unfortunately, uh, I believe the former president um, really skewed what Dr. Fauci was putting out there. So it just led to further mistrust from our people of the government, of healthcare, of COVID and the vaccines. So we're dealing with two types of patients. We're dealing with the patients who believe it's a hoax. And then we're dealing with the patients who don't trust the government. You know, so we, we really are fighting an uphill battle for our people. And then you have the patients who don't go in until it's too late and then they're sicker. Now, Dr. Adams, I know you you have your background at, at Barbara, uh, Mickey Lena, Barbara John Mickey Lena School of Public Affairs. Your background is political science. Yes. So that means you know a little bit about history yes. and a lot about politics and maybe a little bit about law. Yes. Now, with that being said, uh, on the news today, uh, uh, one of the, the, the Congress people was talking and said that there was no plan left for the new administration. How do you see Trump's legacy tied to COVID-19? Well, I think uh, certainly <clears throat> uh, any president, basically you want to leave a, a legacy and we assess uh, the institution of the president and the, pe and the person who holds that office uh, from two vantage points. There's domest domestic policy and also foreign policy. Uh, and every president would and like to at least leave an indelible stamp or some accomplishment. And uh, given all of the, the ugliness of the end of the, uh, the Trump administration, uh, there were some ac accomplishments in terms of the economy, and also some uh, in terms of foreign policy in the Middle East. But I think the ugliness of what happened on January the 6th uh, resulted in, I think, uh, a lot of gaslighting and what we're talking about, the psychological aspect in terms of losing the election, stealing the election, these kinds of things. And that was designed to kind of whip up a, a base. And that has been the problem. And I think the... Uh, that it started with, you know, Trump started with the questioning and with the birth of, with Obama. And when he came down the escalator, uh, you know, he, he made it clearly that uh, it is not us when he was talking about immigration and people coming here. And I think what we've seen is a kind of uh, uh, fueling of a kind of incendiary kind of messaging on the part of this president. Uh, where he was planned to a, a, a base uh, in a kind of alt-right radicalism. And we have to remember at the beginning of the, uh, the Trump administration, he had Steve Bannon, who basically was the person who was driving some of the policy decisions and, 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 and driving uh, the messaging. And I think uh, we also have to, to look at what happened in 2017 in terms of Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, that was ugly, and we saw that. Uh, why, why am I discussing these events, uh, Charles? It's important because I think we saw the, the planting of those seeds that were produced with what happened on, on January the 6th, and basically that uh, was from the messaging, uh, the dog whistling on the part of, of Donald Trump. 
Uh, and, and here again, um, uh, and I, as a political scientist, we have to be objective. And so I try to get away from uh, uh, the, the policy and the partisan support. And, uh, you know, the question is open. Now we have to see what President Biden does. He's in the position and no one should be free from, from criticism. He has a record. Uh, I think he has tried to, uh, to place a kind of diversity stamp in the people we see coming into the cabinet. Uh, there's some first, and certainly we can start with the vice president in terms of Kamala Harris. Uh, she checked several boxes. And, and one of the boxes, you can say whatever she choose to be on a given day in terms of the race questions. And we know that her parents uh, were immigrants from Jamaica and from, East in and from India. And so uh, <clears throat> that was historic uh, in terms of seeing the first woman shatter a glass ceiling, uh, occupying the, the position of vice president of the United States. So that was a historic first and also a, a historic first for a person of, of color. And so uh, I think given what we saw uh, with the exit of the Trump administration and the continuing uh, in terms of challenging the election after the November general election, uh, it kind of fu fuel a kind of fire of uh, alt-right radicalism and uh, that I think may, may continue. We, we're not out of that. And it's very important to get those cabinet members uh, in place and also to make sure that we have the sub cabinets in the position of Homeland Security, because again, uh, we may be sitting on a powder keg because we see a lot of this back and forth in terms of the radicalism. So I'll pause there and let you come back right. with another question. Now, now, Dr. Harris, I wanna talk about your organization. Give us uh, a little history and, and an understanding of your organization. My organization, we, it was about six of us that started the organization as founding members. We uh, decided to embark upon an organization where we as people of color can build each other up in leadership positions, uh, promoting the profession, uh, nurse practitioner role, helping precept new nurse practitioners and nurse practitioner students, educating us and just keeping us abreast on the things that are taking place in healthcare from a variety of areas. So, and as well as promoting and working with the legislator trying to make nurse practitioners in the state of Texas independent or as far as being able to function at the highest level of our education. Right now in Texas, nurse practitioners have to have a physician collaborator to do what we do. And we're trying to remove that restriction so that we can continue to see patients, uh, particularly in rural areas where there may not be a physician available or in those medically underserved areas and populations where patients need to see people who look like them, where we can go in and to help make an impact in the healthcare arena. So that's what we do as a National Black Nurse Practitioner Association. We do community service events uh, every year with the exception of 2020. We work with the Lions uh, Clinic, Lions Foundation to do the uh, festival at Easter time and go out and do blood pressure checks and we bring out information. Uh, we do different community service events throughout the year just to get in the community and to bring awareness to patients and let people know exactly what the nurse practitioner role is. Can, can you give your phone number if somebody wanted to, you know, support you or get in touch with you? You have a number for them? Absolutely. They can call me at 281 260-6622. That is the phone number to my clinic in uh, Greens Point area. And I would be more than happy to direct it, whether it's a patient or someone who needed to talk about the organization. Uh, do you service any rural areas now, uh, uh, surrounding areas to Houston? Yeah, wherever the patient comes from, or if they need me to go out and see them, I will do a house call. So absolutely. So doctors make house calls now? Well, it, it, it's been back and running for probably the last almost 10 years. Doctors are going back in and nurse practitioners as well doing house calls. Best way to minute. get in and see the wait patients. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean I'm behind the scene? I don't, I, I'm not keeping up. I had to, I had to go <laughs> read some more. Lord, you you know, got to get caught up. 
Yeah. Yes, House Calls is back up and running. And uh, it's actually uh, been very impactful because you have to think about your elderly population. Those patients are not coming out. So they're using the emergency rooms as their primary care. And nurse practitioners can really make an impact in healthcare by being that primary care provider. So going into the patient home and making sure that they're having their preventives done, keeping their medications up to date, that is something that we definitely do and have been doing. Yeah. And Charles, so, I'll go back. I'd just like to throw something in. You did mention yeah. the, uh, the executive orders. Uh, I, I think one of those was to, uh, we will rejoin the World Health Organization or to block that. And, and what the, the nurse was saying that the previous president, uh, there was no acknowledgement of, of, of science or the scientific community and, and public health is certainly in the pandemic should be front and, front and center. And I think Dr. Fauci will, if he didn't leave today, he'll be leaving soon to go to a national meeting. And I think that's a good signal coming from the Biden administration uh, that science is very important. So let me ask you this about, you, you know anything about prayer view? <laughs> You asking me or you asking Dr. Adams? No, I, no, I don't know anything about prayer view. I know all of this. Sound like some haters on the line. <laughs> prayer view uh, produces yeah. productive people now. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I asked you, did you know anything about prayer view? So do you work with the uh, the students at prayer view or uh, anywhere? Do you get any interaction with them? Absolutely. The, so, the nursing uh, school, yeah. Yes, I, I'm very active with Prairie Nursing School, both undergraduate and graduate uh, programs for their students. We do precept them. Um, so, given that I am a Prairie View alumni time too, so, um, you know, I do love my school. But I have to say, I my goddaughter is a graduate of TSU and my son okay, is a student well, of TSU. Yeah. So, then I, I, you know, I, I, I give y'all a pass. So I'm okay with TSU. I love y'all too. Great. Okay. Great. So so now, what about have you? I do have a little interaction with the county. Do you have any interaction with the county public health system? Uh, just when they send me the updates on what as providers what we need to know. So um, I would like some connections to the uh, county so we can get some services in Greenspoint. Wow, is that bad? Uh, yes. Now okay. I can say this: you have Dr. Varone, who's not too far. He's off of Titwell and Forty Five, so he is getting a lot of the attention and a lot of the services, but. You know there are more patients in the area who need help that may not want to travel that far. So I'm not going to take away from him, but we're looking at our demographics and where we are. And and see, as Dr. Adams was saying, from an emergency management standpoint, they ought to have satellites and and points of distribution preset for any emergency, man-made or natural. That's built into the policy of emergency management. I didn't understand why when Trump uh, 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 in, in declared a, uh, the natural, a national disaster, I don't know why FEMA didn't kick in automatically from that point. Yeah. Because the staff of that, when it's declared, it's on. And every system already knows what the duty is to do, whether it's distributing vaccine, whether it's distributing ice, whether it's distributing water, that, that's already preset. Yeah. And with the target capabilities that they have to renew every two or three years, I, I just couldn't understand it, unless Trump gave a direct order and said, stand down. That's the only way I can see <laughs> why this didn't happen. Now, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm uh, he Trump may be calling me shortly, y'all. I may have to get off the phone and talk to him. <laughs> I'm gonna ask him what the hell was he thinking about. <laughs> anyway, well, let me just say this before you wrap up: is that most of the services went to the hospitals, you know, and the federally funded clinics. So there wasn't a lack of supplies to them necessarily. It was limited, 
but the priority, even with the lab, lab laboratories that we go through, Quest and LabCorp and those places, they were given orders to send all of the supplies to the hospitals as a priority. Again, people in primary care were not going to the emergency rooms. They were going to their providers. So as the provider in the community, we fell short because we didn't have what we needed in order to continue or even give those patients the care that they needed. Now, let me say this, because I'm saying this, not you, okay? I'm saying this. And then we're going to close out on your segment. And, and I know you have to go, but I'm going to turn, turn attention to Dr. Adams for the last half. But let me tell you this. It seems like there's some doggone politics going on. See, because in one sense, they tell you, do not use the emergency rooms as your primary care. But then they shift all of the supplies to the hospitals where the emergency room and you can't get in the emergency room. That is politics. Then they want to give somebody some supplies down here and down here where we are, we don't get it. So I, 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 I'm going to have to get in touch with you after this because I want to I, I want to raise a little hell. I, I haven't raised a little hell in about six months. And I, so this is a good time for me to get back at you, early 2021. Okay. So we want to give them your number again. And uh, we're going to see that we're going to see your group in another broadcast. And I want you to be on or your group to be on our town hall conversation because that's by phone. Those that can't uh, tune in on Facebook or YouTube, we do the Telly Town for them. So that's going to be your next venue with us is the Telly Town, and then we'll do the, the follow-up to this one, uh, and I'll give you the schedule for that so you can, you know, get some other practitioners that want to come on. So give them your phone number and tell them what you, where you're located and all of those particulars. I'm Dr. Latricia Harrison, family nurse practitioner representing the National Black Nurse Practitioner Association. My clinic is NPC Family Health Clinic, and we're located at 412 North Sam Houston Parkway East, Suite H, Houston, Texas, 77060. The phone number is 281-260-6688. I'm sorry, 281-260-6622. That was the fax number. Okay, so we want to thank you for joining us tonight on Community Science, uh, Community Views and Solution, and Public Access and Public Affairs. And we'll see you next time, Dr. Harrison. All right, thank you. Good night. All right, thank good, night. You. good night. All right, now, Dr. Adams. Yes, sir. Politics, politics. <laughs> Now you're the scientist now, I'm gonna ask the scientific questions. So has Biden in the first two days, how do you assess what you've seen in the in, in this first two days? Well, I, I like it and at the beginning of every uh, administration, uh, you, you, you know, there, there are challenges that, of course, uh, we're facing today that we've never uh, encountered before, not in my lifetime, not in a pandemic. I know they had a flu 100 years ago. Um, but I, I think he did hit the ground running today with those signing those executive orders. Uh, and President, uh, it's good to start off bold. And we, the best typology of a kind of president, you would want someone who's active and positive. There was a political scientist in the 1970s by the name of James Barber. He wrote a book called Presidential Character. And he came up with these very uh, typologies in terms of how they should be ranked in terms of characteristics. And he concluded that the best type was an active positive as opposed to a kind of negative kind of positive uh, person in terms of the ability to get in the office and try to get things done. And I think the, the outgoing uh, president was more from the, the negative standpoint. Uh, we would hope uh, that even uh, given Biden's age, same as Trump's, for, for example, but there were people talking at the beginning of the primary that he was too old to be president, uh, whether he was fit you know, for the job. Uh, we would like to think that he would be active 
and utilize the vice president because that's the other issue. Uh, you can have a good administration, uh, but there has to be a good match and it has to, I think, dovetail or fit with your, your, your agenda that you want to fulfill because we can look at history. If you go back to uh, the John F. Kennedy administration, having Lyndon Johnson on the ticket was a political kind of match. Uh, Kennedy uh, actually didn't really want Lyndon Johnson on the ticket because Lyndon Johnson, I mean, Kennedy's brother, Bobby Kennedy, hated uh, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, but Lyndon Johnson was placed on the ticket. And uh, for students of history, they may remember during the, the beginning of the, uh, the Kennedy administration, uh, the, there was a joke that, that Johnson stayed out of the country than more so than he was in the country. And that was one of the reasons. So it's how you use uh, the people around you. And you know that, Charles, from good administration. So the cabinet will be important. I think the vice president will be important. And I think we have to talk about race. We have to talk about uh, income inequality. Uh, I know uh, there, uh, Biden has put out there on the table in terms of the minimum wage of being $15. Uh, we have to have a liv livable wage, and we can talk about that. People can debate that from a business standpoint. Uh, but we, we are confronting tough times. So the economy and, and trying to invoke uh, or inject money into the economy, excuse me, in terms of the stimulus, uh, that has to be done because people are hurting, businesses are closing, uh, and, and something has to be done. So we hope that he, he hits the ground running and a kind of robust and a kind of active positive. And I think Biden uh, basically, he, he's an old school politician. He, he's, uh, uh, he's, from the, he's a throwback to the days of Sam Raven to kind of go along to get along. Uh, and what he was saying during the presidential campaign uh, that he would be good for the country because he could work with people across the aisle. Uh, we do have a, a divided government. It's a 50-50 split. We know what happened in Georgia. We got the two Democrats elected. And so now, uh, in terms of getting things shepherded through the, uh, the, we know that the Democrats control the House of the Representatives, uh, but also the Senate. Uh, if there is a tie, Kamala Harris now is the vice president, she can cast that tie break and vote. Uh, but in terms of the rule of operations in the, in the Senate, there has been some discussion over the last two days uh, between the new uh, leader of the Senate, uh, the majority leader who is now uh, Chuck Schumer from New York. Uh, McConnell is, is now, now out, but the rules are there and we still have the filibuster, uh, even with the majority. So uh, the, there has to be some discussions of whether or not they're gonna change the rules or will they keep uh, the filibuster or have what we call the nuclear option, where again, anything to get something done because even if you have the 50 senators that are Democrat, or we, actually it's 48, two are independent, and certainly Bernie Sanders was one of the independents. Most people don't understand that, but they always caucus with the Democrats. So, but with that filibuster out there looming, that they can chug, they can block stuff in terms of the Republicans and to get something done, basically you would have to have 60 uh, senators and you would have to have at least 10 Republicans to go along. So that is still being hashed out in terms of the rules. Uh, in the Senate. Now we have Let to understand. I'm, I'm sorry, Charles. Go ahead. Let, let me make this announcement. Okay. For the veterans uh, that are in the audience, and for the widows of veterans that are in the audience, uh, if you know of a veteran or a widow, and they need some assistance on housing repair from Hurricane Harvey. Call the Houston Area Urban League at 281-220-6012. 281-220-6012. Ask for Glenda Kizzy. And that's if you're a veteran and need housing. I also want to say that uh, we are trying to schedule Congressman Al Green on the show, he's gonna talk about uh, some veteran uh, issues, but he's gonna talk about his uh, house bill. Are you familiar with uh, Al Green's house bill on reparations? Uh, yes, yes, I can talk okay. on that. But the, but the other important piece of legislation 
uh, we may be able to get a, a Voting Rights Act, and certainly that would uh, restore pre-clearance. That's 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 there too. And reparations, uh, I hope we can get some traction. You know, but the irony, Charles, is that they come up with all this money for the pandemic, but you know, for the for the reparations, you know, there was some debate, and even within the black community, whether or not you know that was a good idea uh, in terms of paying rep reparations. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Um question that's on everybody's mind across the globe everybody's number one question are you ready for it dr adams i was, I was you know coming from the guru man i don't know it depends <laughs> how you throw it so <laughs> how you toss it man okay well everybody wants to know is donald trump going to jail uh, I, I don't think so because uh, I did see catch some news even even in the uh, the busy uh, work day I've had today. Um, even I think there's going to be a delay in the trial and see because again Biden, you 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 have to get your cabinet in place. You have to hit the ground running. You have to be active. The first hundred days are going to be very important. And the whole notion I don't I don't think he's going to jail. All right to say that. I, I think he will be a factor. Um, uh, well, you never can predict whether somebody will, will a criminal trial, but uh, I, I don't believe that will be the case. I think he'll be around and 21 months from now, your audience should be aware of the fact uh, that we'll have midterm elections. That's, that's a short time. And certainly uh, we've heard some discussions of uh, Donald Trump uh, thinking about primarying Rubio, uh, Marco Rubio down in Florida, Ivanka Trump may run for that position. So I, I think you're going to see there, I think Trump garnered about 75 million voters. So there are a lot of people out there who still believe and, and that movement, I think, will will continue. Uh, well, technology is also important. Go ahead. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, there's a, there's a district attorney in New York that says she's going to pursue all and every avenue. And there are, there's talk uh, in the, in the uh, current alphabet system, the FBI and all of them mm -hmm. are looking at the uh, validity of Trump being charged with treason. Yeah. For leading well, the call. Yeah, but uh, we have to talk about politics. And, 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 and I think, uh, and, and again, I'm not here to defend Trump uh, any stretch of imagination. I'm looking at how government works. And, and I think, again, we, we've seen some backing away because, again, I, I told you to, uh, in order to make, to get things accomplished, any successful president has to be able to get his policy proposed, a uh, proposal through the, uh, the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. And, but, but wait a minute, uh, let me ask you this. If McConnell, if McConnell has opened the door mm -hmm. and and Elizabeth McCain has uh Cheney, I mean Liz Cheney, right? Yeah. Right. If they've opened the door for the other senators to convict him in the Senate, and Nancy Pelosi is driving it from the House. Right. Uh you don't see that as a perfect storm? Yeah, well, that you, I'm sure you've heard of a double-edged sword. It can cut both ways. <laughs> so, um, one, uh, Liz Cheney, the other folks, and again, it's this Trump movement, and I'm not here to have it, but I understand politics, all right? If that base, a lot of these people, uh, you know, they, folks live in the districts, and anything that politicians, uh, there are two things that are always on their mind, I tell my students, that's election and re-election. And I said, and again, I repeat, 21 months from now, we, we'll know how a lot of this stuff is going to play in terms of the, the election. And I think we'll see a lot of those Republicans uh, still will we'll stay with, with Trump. And uh, we have uh, uh, four years from now, there's a presidential election and, and people are trying to position themselves. And the whole question is whether or not there, there's a stop, stop Trump movement in the sense, I don't, I don't, I, that's why I said I can't speak on the, on the jail part, but I, but I know uh, if they do have a trial, the whole question, and this is unprecedented, whether or not he can be banned from holding office or running again in terms of the president, because again, the impeachment process is where the House charges 
and the Senate conducts the trial to convict and remove, all right? And in the, uh, the conviction stage or the sentencing stage, they can actually ban a person from holding a, 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 a federal office, all right? Well, what about Tom Cruise, Ted Cruz and yeah. Hawley? Are they gonna be ejected from the uh, Senate? Well, again, in, in terms of uh, the, the Senator and members of Congress, uh, you have censorship, all right, where they can say, hey, you've been bad, you've been a bad boy, stuff like that. Of course, that's like a slap on the wrist to some people. Uh, but I, I don't know if you remember, Charles, the flamboyant Adam Clayton Powell, all right? Uh, uh, first, they didn't want to see him, for example, and there was a Supreme Court case called Powell versus McCormick, all right? And Adam Clayton Powell, he was a very flamboyant uh, minister from New York, uh, from Harlem, actually. Uh, he just, he, he lived on a boat in, in, in Bimini, all right? He wasn't even going to the Congress and, and certainly he was a very powerful member of the House of Representatives and he got on the wrong side of the Southern Democrats and they hated him. So they didn't want to see him. So it was a Supreme Court case. And the ruling in that case is that it's not up to the Congress to, to recognize or to remove a person from being seated or to not to seat a person, it's up to the electorate, to the voters. And by extension, what they were saying, if the people didn't, from Harlem didn't want him, they sent him back to the Congress and they had that right to do that. So that, that's mm. out there. So, so we're, 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 we're treading in uncharted waters, I'll say that, on a lot of these issues. And as, and as a scientist, I don't like to conjecture and go down that road. So, you know, we're, we're just not, we, we can have another conversation when we're just shooting the bull, you know, over yeah. in the back booth at, at Luby's and just having a conversation. But yeah. I, I, I think there's some responsibility that you have to have if you're in the academy in terms of some of the things that, that you say and how you see it, right? I see. So now, what's happening at Texas Southern Barbara Jordan Mickey Leland School of Public Affairs? How's everything over there? Well, we're, we're still there. Uh, we, we, we're still wedded to the mission uh, and of, uh, uh, of Dr. Sawyer in terms of being an urban university. And uh, certainly, uh, uh, we're there and, and uh, we're closed down now, but hopefully if we can get through this pandemic and you have the nurse on, uh, we have the problem in terms of getting people vaccinated. So we don't know when we're gonna have herd immunity. Well, we'll be able to uh, go back to, to normal. And who knows, we may, right now we, we're doing virtual learning, uh, but we, we're still working. I'm, I'm working, we're committed. Uh, conferences I think are being planning, planned. Uh, at the university, and I would like to do something on globalization. I'll talk to you later about how you can get involved with that. And we may try to pull that off uh, in the month of April uh, because uh, I won't be able to take students on study abroad. And, right. you know, uh, at least three times a year, I was taking students to, uh, to Ghana and West Africa uh, and, and Benin. And also we were doing Brazil. Uh, and I think that's a part of this discussion we, we have to have. And I think when you talked to me earlier today, uh, we talked about Black Lives Matter in terms of just Black people in general, in terms of the world over. What does this moment in time mean to us? All right, how do we digest this? Right. Well, let me, let me ask you this. We got three minutes uh, before we close up. What's your take on the District B challenge? Are you familiar with the District B City of Houston challenge? challenging that uh, Tasha Jackson's registered application house is not in the district. It's outside of the district. Therefore, some complaints are being filed about, about that. Is that? I've, I've seen some of that, but I think it's now it's up to the city attorney to come up with the ruling. And that was like in the uh, annexation. Uh, I can't think of the acronym, but if there's an area, for example, there, uh, you you were not supposed to be qualified to to run, so there there's been some some back and take. Uh, but as a resident of the third ward, I try to stay out of Northside Fifth Ward politics. And, uh, all so, right, well we're gonna, they, we're gonna I'm gonna leave friends to all of them, right? So right, well we're gonna leave it there till next time. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us on Community right. Science. We want to thank uh, Mark Pertle for being our engineer and our tech guy. And uh, we'll be back again next week, I mean, next month. And we're gonna have more discussion on these issues. And Mark, would you, would you run all those slides we have, the Black Lives Matter, 
and the uh, the January 6th, the discrepancy of how they were prepared for a peaceful protest, but were not prepared for a takeover of the American government. This is Charles X. White signing off tonight. Thank you for joining us. We'll have it rebroadcast and booted up on YouTube and Facebook or Charity Production. We'll see you next time. Goodbye and have a good night. Thank you.